<laughs> okay, so this, um, this morning we are going to examine a harrowing journey at sea. There were violent winds, tsunami waves, hunger, desperation. And to the eyes of all but one person on the boat, no way to get to safety. We'll look at these, we'll look at all the ways these desperate men dealt with this most stressful experience and how we might learn from their decisions. We'll follow this group of men from all walks of life and how a boat ride changed their trajectory. Finally, we're going to look at a single word that can completely transform us today. So, Let's start with this. Okay, it's going to take a couple seconds and we're going to see if we can slip it through. Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip that started from this tropic port aboard this tiny ship. Come on, you know the words. The mate was a mighty sailing man, the skipper brave and sure. Five passengers set sail that day for a three-hour tour, a three-hour tour. They started getting rough, the tiny ship was tossing. If not for the courage of the fearless crew, the minnow would be lost. The minnow would be lost. The ship's aground on the shore of this uncharted desert isle. With Gilligan, the skipper too. The millionaire and his wife. The movie star, the professor and Mary Ann. Okay, it worked, yay, okay. Now you're showing how old you are. If you know all the words to that, chances are, you know, you've just outed yourself. I knew the words too. Reruns, there you go. Okay, so we got to see this, but now, now, let's see a little bit more of reality. I just want to kind of set the table here a little bit. If you get, if you resonate a little bit of the fright and oh my goodness, and the tsunami is headed for me, doesn't have to be water. For some of us this morning, we are dealing with some hurricane winds in our lives, and you know what that is for you. But I, I wanted to start there. I was led to start there, with you know we have fun with Gil again right? But the second clip is probably a little more accurate for what's going on, the spirit that's been unleashed in the world today. And so we're all experiencing it. So let's be together now and see how the Father can help us navigate some of these difficult waves that are hitting. So in order to move forward, we need to look at the political, religious, and complicated chain of events that gathered these travelers together. So what do we know about Paul? This is from Acts 27. What do we know about the Apostle Paul at this point in his life? Now this is what I wanna do is I wanna help you to, to understand what led him to get on the boat, to get him on the ship. Apostle Paul, this was his third missionary campaign and it states in Acts 24:17. <clears throat> that Paul was bringing alms to the nation to present offerings. Now we know right now, and I'm thrilled that Larry prayed this because I was going to pray that there are no two separate political parties fighting each other in the church. 
we should all be team J, team Jesus, team God. If we're, that's where we're, that's where we vote, right? We vote on God's side every time. And it should, all the rest of it is a clamor and a noise and a distraction from finding the truth, all right? So it's, it's so vital that we stay consistent in our message so that it does not get confused with talking points of political parties, right? We want to stay our course, and that's what this is also about. So Paul's reputation preceded him. He was antagonistic to the Jewish system. And remember, he's a Pharisee's Pharisee. So on the one hand, he's antagonistic to the Jewish system. So to, to calm a potentially volatile situation, Paul agreed to submit to ceremonial cleansing or purification in the temple, the Jewish custom for those who had been to Gentile lands. So in essence, you've been exposed to the world. When you come back into the fold, you need to clean yourself off. Because Paul had already been seen in the city with a Gentile from Ephesus, a rumor had spread that Paul had committed a capital offense in taking Greeks into the temple. So it's very parallel with our political climate and cancel culture. We can see even then, Paul is doing exactly the polar opposite of what the Jewish custom was at that time. Gentiles over there, Jews over here. And Paul says, I've, I've seen the Lord. I Come on, everybody come. Everyone, everyone's invited. He is speaking Jesus' words. Well, the people that felt that they had position with God because they had been taught that through the oral laws, the Pentateuch, all the way back from Genesis. No, 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 we have position. And Paul said, well, I used to think that way, but the truth came to me, and so everyone enter in. So riots took place. Paul was saved only by Roman officials. They intervened with 470 soldiers, according to Acts 23, 23. Now think about it. It took 470 Roman soldiers to quiet the riot that was coming against Paul. I don't know about you, but I've noticed a riot or two in the past couple years myself. This heavy guard took Paul to Herod's place in Caesarea, where he was repeatedly interrogated. Before King Agrippa, in his own defense, Paul says these words, Acts 26, 9 and 10. I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote. In context, Paul's words were all the more convincing to those who did understand that he was a Pharisee's Pharisee, conforming to the strictest sect of his religion. Now let me give you a little modern day context of what Paul was doing. With midterm elections just a couple days away, hearing Paul say that he cast his vote for death to Christ followers becomes more than just something that happened thousands of years ago. We've seen the impact this year in the increased persecution of the church. Paul presenting himself now to the king and all the most powerful people with the persuasive passion, the opposite of his pharisaical beliefs, would be like Alexis McGill Johnson, the president and CEO of Planned Parenthood Federation, testifying before Congress and hundreds of reporters and cameras that she's been wrong all along. Life does begin at conception, 
and her organization is corrupt to its very foundation for their greedy ways, giving these types of facts. In the fiscal year of 2021 alone, 1,055, 53 babies were killed each day through abortion. That's one every 82 seconds. If Alexis McGill Johnson then said that Planned Parenthood is not about reproductive rights and supporting women, but a political entity that does sell murdered babies for profit and will stop at nothing to continue their pursuit of power, influence, wealth, and political impact, with this CEO now asking to lead everyone in a prayer of repentance with an altar call, this would be as profoundly impacting as Paul's conversion from Pharisee to Christ follower. But the fact that Paul had that history and was now standing before all made others curious and validated the truth of his conversion. Acts 26, 11 through 12 says that after two years and no justice, Paul realizes he'll never receive a fair hearing and under the circumstances, so exercising his right as a Roman citizen, he appeals his case to Caesar. Now, of note, and here's a question. Do you think Paul thought of all the Christians he persecuted before his own salvation moment? We tend to think of just the words on the page when we read a story, but when we step into the moments with them, it can be quite compelling to see that Paul in prison for over 700 days had the memory of all the Christians he sent to prison and death. Acts 27 gives us a very detailed look written by Luke, a man who witnessed the harrowing journey and gives us kind of behind the scenes details and insights that only a premier historian and a medical doctor can bring. So, for all the previous travels of Paul, he had been a free man, but now he was a prisoner of Rome. Paul is made ready to embark on a ship under escort and as a prisoner on charges of sedition and serious unrest in Jerusalem. He's entrusted to a centurion named Julius. And the fact that he's named the centurion is named, says so much about the impact this one soldier had. He, Luke, and some 276 men in total prepare to set sail. And this now positions us for the message today. Now let's be honest. If this was a television program, we might be tempted to turn the channel. I watch shows where they are always trying to create tension, right? Drama in the midst of the characters, in their personal experiences as well with others. But sometimes in the midst of trying to entertain, it just gets frustrating because I'm impatient for something, some sort of finish line somewhere. Think of it, two years, 730 days, Paul was in prison. Now we say that and we kind of pass over it, but I want you to think of your own life today. No privacy, no control, loss of everything familiar. People in authority over you decide when you can eat, where you can go. You're in a place of waiting and wondering what's going to happen next. Just waiting to be released from the prison you're in. Can anyone relate? to that today. In that place, people are making decisions for me that I do not agree with. So being in a state of waiting for the next thing to happen could describe our key word today. Perhaps you've dealt with that in the reality of the past few years and also in positioning moving forward. The word is prostakao, prostakao, it's a Greek word and it means to expect, whether in thought, in hope, or in fear. 
to look for, to wait for, prostikao. Paul goes from prison cell to confined on a ship. Innocent, innocent of all charges and honoring God all the days of his life after his, even, even when he was a Pharisee's Pharisee, he was still serving God in the way he knew. And so he's rising to the top in both, in both arenas. He embarks on this journey with a different outcome than anyone could have expected. Now here's a, a map just really quick. So you can kind of see that red line is kind of showing you the distance that he went from Caesarea, he sailed to Sidon, then Fair Havens on Crete, where he stayed until the day after atonement. I don't have a, one of those laser pointers. He sailed west until he was shipwrecked on Malta. So the ship left Caesarea, sailed to Sidon, Mira. Along the way, they stopped at the southern coast of Crete um, for safe harbor, Julius, and the owner of the ship chose not to wait out the weather in Fair Havens. And they should have. So they headed off for the island of Crete. And this is where we read in Acts 27.10, Oops. Can can he have the the microphone? There's an test. Test. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Paul advised them saying, "Men, I perceive that this journey, this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives." Paul saw the same weather everyone else did. He knew the trajectory of where they were going. Can you imagine this prisoner speaking out this way? Okay, stop. Paul saw the same weather everyone else did. He, he did know the trajectory. We understand now that Paul had a level of discernment that brought about his eyes to see in the circumstance. But those around him did not have that understanding. Paul was ignored. Those in charge made their choice and sailed on. Question, can you relate to Paul here? You know what is right, but those in power and influence are making decisions for you. And even though you can see that you're being taken into the storms, we also have choices to make today. Recognizing that we cannot control the choices of others. But we must remain true to our position. Continue in the role the Lord has given us and trust that he is the one that guides our ships to their ultimate destination. Ultimately, shortly after Paul speaks of the coming calamity, a catastrophic storm took control of the ship, and this position prepares us for where we want to look most closely today. Okay, now Valor. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Kouda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure, so the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. 
but now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when about midnight the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land. But they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were there to get planks or on other pieces of ships were to get there on planks. And in this way, everyone reached land safely. That's a powerful story, isn't it? So this slide um, shows before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. Now, I am not nautical. I, I no. So I thought, well, this might be interesting just to find out a little bit of information of what's actually going on here. So here is a one minute video to see actually how this a boat works, sailboat works. Well, no need to look far. Because the secret sailors like to call the keel is hidden right beneath us. Remember that a sailboat is actually an airplane on its side. The sail is one of the wings and the keel is the other one hidden underwater. When lift from the sails tries to move the boat at an angle, the water, which you can think of as much denser air, pushes on one side of the keel and pulls from the other side creating lift. In this regard, keels are no different from sails or wings. However, unlike wings of an airplane which create lift in the same direction, up, the wings of a sailboat creates lift in different directions, both at an angle from where you want to go, which individually would be unhelpful, but when the effects are taken together, the result is the forward propulsion we were looking for. And that's how sailboats work and sail into the wind. I just think that that kind of stuff I find so fascinating. So like a plane, one, one, how sailboats work. So knowing nothing about sailing boats, winds, how to get from where I am to where I want to go, 
And I'm so glad that my husband is not saying, well, how is that any different than when you're driving a car? Um, you know, I would think if I want to go straight, then I point the boat in that direction. But that's not how it works at all. So it would be the natural thing to do, to try and go straight. But as we see on the water, if we do not account for the wind position and the tension in the sails, we limit our ability to move. But even more important, the keel. It is beneath the surface. You cannot see it in the natural. It's under. It is the equally important component of a sailboat. As the video shows, it's the other wing like a plane uses. And without it, steering is the mo in the most safe and effective ways becomes nearly impossible. In other words, the keel is the spine of the boat. It balances the ballast so you don't tip over. A boat without a keel is a dinghy beneath the surface. The backbone keeps you from drifting. The video shows it's using both what we see above the surface and trusting in what is beneath the keel that keeps us going straight. In our story, the normal ways the sailors would combat the raging storms, trimming the sails, maneuvering in position, all their expertise could not control their boat against the storm. So they gave way to it and were driven along. Instead of putting their boat at risk, trying to control it in the storm, they let the power of the storm momentarily take them. They kind of rode it out. We all know what it is to choose our battles carefully. And today, more than ever, we need wisdom to recognize the timing of our engaging in the storms that come against us. Before long, a wind of hurricane force called, called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a... Did I read that part? Keep going. Okay. As I'm just we, renewing I'm that sorry. for this As part. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Kuda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. They were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Syrtis. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm ra continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. Thank you. They bring the lifeboat aboard. So this removes the possibility of any sailors abandoning ship. Not only that, but picture it. They are wrapping ropes around the ship to keep it in one piece. They're dropping the sea anchor. What that means is that would be like pumping the brakes or opening a parachute to kind of slow, try and slow things down. So think of, think of the panic on board of what they're trying to, trying to stay alive. Verse 18 says, due to violent battering, they threw their cargo overboard. Now we Think of that. This could be a death sentence to the owner of the ship. People paid for that cargo to get where it's going. They're on their way to Rome, not the most forgiving place. They're expected to be delivered. You can almost hear the shock in verse 19 when we read that the ship's tackle was thrown overboard by their own hands. Tackle is anything that's not affixed to the ship. Symbolically, this would be like a person who's a chef destroying their oven, their pots, their pans, their cooking utensils, every way to provide for now and the future. So this brings us to our scripture verse this morning, Acts 27, 20. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, 
we finally gave up all hope of being saved. You know what? They were right. The men on the boat couldn't save themselves. Even though they did everything they knew to do, all of their self-reliant ways that had worked in the past now failed them. Even the owner of the boat, most likely came from generations and generations of sailors, couldn't fix the problem. Like the experts we all know about that all have an answer. and This is what we're going to do. And then we're going to do this. And then it's like, no, 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 we're going to do that. No, 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 we're going to do, right? Have we seen this happen maybe? Question, what do you think of when you read or hear when neither sun nor stars appeared? Picture this, you're driving in your car with a blindfold on. You've not eaten in nearly two weeks. You're wet, cold, you haven't seen a toothbrush or a bar of soap, and you'd pay good money for just one stick of deodorant to share with perhaps any of the others in your car. Careening down a road you've never been on during a hailstorm with all the windows broken out so the sound of the air whooshing past you is so loud you can scream at the top of your lungs and someone sitting right next to you cannot hear you. And at any moment you can careen off a cliff and you'd never see it coming. Can you imagine 14 seconds of this? How about try 336 hours of this? Because that is what these men were dealing with. Prostakao, prostakao, to expect, whether in thought, in hope, or in fear, to look for, wait for. Ever notice the times you are most desperate in the storms of your lives? Are the very moments you are most ready to hear and obey God? No matter how opposite it is to what you've always known or are comfortable with? What did these sailors have? They had no GPS. No sextant will help orient you when you can't see the stars in the sky. You could crash into the rocks or another boat. No modern navigational tools. There was literally nothing to guide them. Not only that, we take our modern lighting for granted. They had no flashlights. They had no spotlights. The best they could do would be a candle, but the storms would make that impossible. Add the relentless rains, the violent winds. The truth is, storms get our attention. We get to the end of our own confidences and start to look and be open to things we'd never, ever consider before. Here's an example, and this is a personal example. Ascanio Sobrero of Turin in 1847 discovered that violent headaches occurred with precision when this compound was introduced to volunteers. With experimentation and the belief that likes, like cures like, Constantine Herring in 1849 began to use this substance to help cure headaches. Alfred Nobel joined Theophile Jules Pelouse in 1851 when he recognized the potential of this compound and began the manufacturing of this product and was himself refused treatment, though he suffered from acute angina. Over 15 years later, Lauder Broughton, the father of modern pharmacology, used this compound, this powerful vasodilator, to relieve angina. One one hundredth of a grain of chocolate in the early 20th century, scientists worked to learn how this substance functioned. Why am I telling you this? Because on September, 20, on September 2nd, with my blood pressure soaring over 212, over we didn't, I don't even remember what the number was, a young woman put this substance under my tongue, nitroglycerin. And my first thought was, and I'm not kidding, my first thought was, 
who would ever think to put the same, albeit a stable version of a compound that makes dynamite go boom under someone's tongue to save their lives. Now, if you just entered that scene when this young nurse was about to put this under my tongue, and all you knew about it was that that's what makes dynamite go boom, you might rush in and arrest her for attempted murder. To the sailors on the boat, all they knew is what they knew. But sometimes for us, like the sailors aboard this ship, it's what we don't know that draws us to the one who knows all. We're going to pass this. At first glance, after Paul shares that last night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me, says, don't be afraid. This is going to, we're going to make it through this, not a hair of your head is going to be harmed. At first glance, it almost looks like when Paul says, man, you should have taken my advice. Now, I don't know, if you're a woman in this room and you read this, maybe men too, but when I hear, man, you should have taken my advice, you shouldn't have done this, you shouldn't have sailed on, you can almost get the hip thing, right? Right? But I believe there's a little bit more to Paul reminding them this. Because he's saying that, hey, I know right now you're in a crisis, and I know that it's all coming down on you, but just take a moment and remember that before this all hit, I was over here telling you the truth. I know that you're getting caught up in this. I know it's coming down. I know you can't see, you can't hear, you're just at, we all know people that are either in this right now, have dealt with it, or God's preparing us for those who will, that the crisis takes them over. It's so much. I'm so overwhelmed. In fact, recently I was helping someone who, even in my offer to help, it overwhelmed them. It was just too much to take. But in that moment, not in a, I told you so, but in a, hey, you know what? I was with you before this hit. Remember? Have confidence in the one that is the same before your issue and in the middle of it, and let me help you get through it. Just as Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and always. That helps me when I'm in the middle of something, going, okay, yeah, but God is still the same. And I believe that's what that... Paul, I'm giving Paul the benefit of the doubt here. Remember, they're starving, scared. Death is intimate. No one's thinking about anything other than what they're thinking about. Verse 23 says that Paul reveals his identity. This is when we see him in revealing his identity, saying, the God to whom I belong, to whom I serve. The reminder. There's a story of a lifeguard who stood at the bank watching a drowning man flail in the water until he sank before he jumped in. Later, he was asked by a bystander, why did you wait so long to help this? You just stood there and watched this guy flailing until he dropped under the water. The lifeguard replied, if I'd tried while he still had strength, he might have drowned me as well. But once he was exhausted, he wouldn't fight my reaching out to him. And then I could save him. Similarly, God can't save you from the storms until you're ready to surrender. My title for today's sermon is Give Up. The angel of the Lord appeared after the men gave up all hope of being saved. What does it mean to give up in the eyes of the world? Quit, forfeit, handed over, relinquished, abandoned, deserted, discarded, forsaken. Ever heard yourself or someone else say, oh, I give up? I mean, you can see someone across the room and not even hear them, and they just go, 
It's either in frustration or anger, resignation, or I've shut down. I give up. But what if we took a step back this morning together and looked at this another way? To the world, I give up looks like this. Down. But what if it became, Lord, I give If we take the ship, our boat, our life, our identity, our financial crisis, our schooling, our job, political, this, all the stuff that we could all gather up, Satan wants it to go like this. I just give up. I, give, it, I am so frustrated. I am fed up. No matter what I say, no matter what, da, 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 right? It is so easy to veer, to veer off and veer down, right? Gravity just pulls us right down. What happens if we go in the God direction and say, I give up. I give up. Even with this angel of the Lord appearing and the encouragement that every single person would survive, the response and responsibility of the men didn't stop there, right? And it's key, brothers and sisters, that when we walk along with someone to encourage them, that we don't hang up the phone or walk away and don't give them practical help. Give them, meet them in their need. What is going on? Sometimes doing a load of laundry or food or there's times where, especially at Lifehouse, where people are just so much. It's like, okay, what can I? One of the things that seems to be really good too is I call it the prayer call. The prayer call. Well, I'll tell someone when I'm ministering to them, I'll say, look, if you get jammed up, text me. I need a prayer call. And I'll call them, and they put their phone on speaker, and they put it down. And I just pray over them. That's it. I just pray. They don't have to say anything. They don't have to share anything. They don't have to say a word. I just pray over them, and then I hang up. And it takes all the pressure and stress of them having to, you know, when you, when you share a difficulty with someone, and then you shared it with another one, another one, you get exhausted in the telling of how exhausted you are. But when you say prayer call, they can just say, can you do a prayer call in 10 minutes or five? Yes. And then boom. And then just prophetically, Lord, help me to pray. I don't need the details. God has them. Give me the words. And it makes it super easy, right? It's a no stress situation for them. And I always tell them, what I always say is, look, I'm doing all the heavy lifting. You don't do anything. Just put me on speaker. We'll go from there. Paul says in 27, 26, chapter 27, Acts 26, we must run aground on some island. It's not that the Lord spoke to Paul, Paul shared, and then a legion of angels came and picked up the boat and they went, you know, to Rome. It didn't happen, right? The storm still raged. The boat still shook. The people were still dealing with life's problems and life's crises. It didn't just all melt away, right? But, but when we see how this one man speaking over this group of 276 men with, they're out there on there, they're out in the middle of the ocean in these kinds of crises. Boy, I relate to that. I re it resonates so deeply in my heart today because I recognize it's not enough to say something, it's believing what God is doing and being part of that, manifest, manifesting the doing in ourselves, our families, in the lives of those that God assigns to us. Verse 27 speaks about the 14th night, still being driven across the sea. About midnight, sailors sense the approaching land and it's like an atmosphere thing, like when they get closer to land, the air, because it, it, it get colder and, and it changes. They kind of felt it. They sounded for, they went 120 feet, then 90 feet. So now they know they're, they're getting closer. They took these soundings, fearing as we would da be dashed against the rocks. They dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. Think of that. It's like, well, we're taking a guess here. 
but we're going to try and do the best we can to kind of stay in place until we can actually see again. Does anyone in this room feel blind, absolutely blind, or blind, blindsided by we're thinking we're going this way, and then something just absolutely just throws, throws the government off, throws the CDC, I just throws it right out the. It's like okay, I'm with you. Boom, completely blind. I'm just praying for daylight. I'm just praying for the sun to shine again. The word the Father gives me is I'm praying for normalcy. I'm praying for some semblance of I can depend on this happening. I can rely on this happening. I I need to feel that rhythm in my life again. Verse 29 says, in that fearing, fearing they would be dashed to the rocks, they prayed for daylight. The word here in the pray um, is actually a word um, that can mean will or wish, but its primary use is to pray. How did these men go from, you know, we got prisoners on board. We got sol- soldiers, we got sailors. How, what caused them to go from doing everything they could, to now praying. After the angel appeared, after Paul encouraged, the shifts in atmosphere supernaturally, spiritually happen before we see him in the natural. And the truth is, when I was researching this sermon, I found that the majority of people that spoke on this passage really focused on the four anchors. What are the four anchors that they used? And they're really good, I mean, really good sermons out there about that. But that wasn't where the Lord led me. Some of the four anchors that I read was, you know, God, whom we trust, faith so we can act, the ship, which would be like church fellowship and support, and the bread, the word of God that nourishes our soul. All really great, all really great. Also faith, surrender, thanksgiving, all good. But... Only you know what anchors you in place. Only you know. The te- these teachings were wonderful, but this morning I want to focus on where I was led, which is God who anchors us in place um, is only as strongly connected to us as our own chain link. Your chain, what links you to God, your anchor, if it's God, when the crisis comes and you're your anchor of belief, seeking, worship, all the things that we do to stay in relationship with God, if that's not attended to, then the anchor that's at the bottom of the ocean because your weak link broke it off is not going to do you much good when the storm comes, is it? The truth is nurturing our connection to God, the anchor. So when the storms come, we are anchored in place. We are connected because something's got to connect the anchor of God to the boat of our lives. Something's connecting there. Christ, the blood of Christ, the pursuit of relationship with him is what does this. That's why a chain is as strong as its weakest link really comes into play when we're hitting a crisis. But what if we use that link, that linkage, that chain, to describe our own beliefs? It, you wouldn't take a $10,000 ring, diamond ring, and wear it on a chain around your neck that you got at the 99 cent store, now would you? You wouldn't do that. The mistrust of God, fears and false beliefs, unforgiveness, bitterness, hardened hearts, and pride are just some of the areas on our links that can be weakened. So that when the storm hits, we default to anger at God. God, where are you? Where, Where? Now we know that God is in us, around us, and with us at all times. So what's your weak link this morning? Verse 30, and this is the end. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay, 
on the boat, unless they stay here, we're, we're, we cannot be saved. We find that the sailors try to escape on the lifeboat. I ask you this morning, can you blame them? <laughs> right? It's like, I want out of this. I want out. But verse 31 tells us that Paul speaks to Julius the centurion and says, hey, they, we all need to stay together here. We're all together. It's powerful if you think about it. Stay in the boat. The Lord shows in this compelling moment that he sees centurion, sailor, soldier, criminals the same when it comes to rescue. Paul was the anointed one. The truth is, he knew he was going to get to Rome. God told him he would. This wasn't about Paul getting there. This was about Paul pleading for the heathen, the Gentiles, the one that don't, doesn't know God. He wants to get them there. He wants to get them. He wants to get them safe and alive. So just being in the vicinity of this one man. Now, yes, there was Luke and Aristarchus. He did have his own little community. Paul did. But the truth is, these men were watching Paul from the beginning. Don't think that they hadn't heard of this guy. They didn't know. I mean, he would almost be like a celebrity on the ship, you know, even amongst the prisoners. They knew. They had, they knew. They knew who he was. They talk. Men talk. Don't think men don't gossip. You men, I, you guys are worse than women. I, I'm telling you. They are. Thank you for that. Amen, sister. In, I'm, I'm almost done. In Paul's prayer for the ship and passengers in the terror-filled days, we don't know all the things that Paul did. We, we, nor what he said to the men, all the many tearing hours at sea. We don't know. What would you do? What would you do if you were in this circumstance? I would hope and pray that each of us would not be, you know, cowering in the bottom of the ship, hoping it all to pass. I would hope that if we knew that there were people on board and it looked like death was imminent, that we would be calling down the fire of God, slaying him in the spirit, praying them to heaven, leading them to Jesus. I mean, we would just be throwing everything we could at them, right? Especially if we knew, we knew that we're going to make it. I'm safe. Help me, let me help you make you safe. Question, are there any signs that changes were taking place in the hearts of the men on board? No, you don't have to read it because I'm wrapping this up. When, it's interesting, for the last 14 days, as we had mentioned earlier before, they'd been in constant suspense, yes? But in verse 38, it says, when they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. Now that is like Peter who sees Jesus on the shore putting on his coat and then jumping into the water to, to swim. Do you recall that? Jesus, wait, let me put on my coat and then jump into the water to... I, I love the giddy, innocent, child way of that. Like, I'm so excited, you know, let me put this on. But think about it. They eat, they haven't eaten, so they eat everything they want. They eat till they're full. Then they dump overboard <laughs> their grain. Do you want to see a conversion of someone? To me, that's, that's proving their, how born again so many were. Trusting Paul so, com so completely that I'm eating this and I trust you. I don't need it anymore. Yeah. Even though I'm not at the, I'm not, I don't see the shore. I don't see the land. It's still raining. I'm still, but you told me to eat, Paul. Okay. The same man who told them, don't go, don't go. There's a storm. Come, don't go. They ignored him just 14 days earlier. And now they're believing him so much that they're eating the very food. Think about it. They hadn't eaten that food because they wanted to survive right? So they're, eat, they're not eating anything because they're trying to make it as far as they can. If they eat all their food, they're not going to have any. So they're not eating. So if they live longer. And in one fell swoop, Paul says, an angel came. We're going to make it. Let's chow down. They didn't see the angel. They didn't. Know, they, that's how compelling this man was. Why? Because he was a Pharisee's Pharisee who had stood before the king and said the polar opposite of what they would have expected. I mean, that is what is going to do it on the world today. Amen. That's it, right there. If we want people feasting in Christ, then we have to live it so out loud, they can't, they're gonna dump, 
They're going to dump all their heathen ways, their sinful ways, the things they've always done, and say, you know what? You do have a better way. You know, I do believe you. Why? Because you told me before the crisis hit, and now I, re you, I renew my mind. That's right. You, you know what? You did say that. Hmm. That was the truth then. And if it was the truth then, it's the truth now. So they dump everything off. Okay, so they've, they're, it's just basically at this point, it's a big piece of wood and 276 men sitting on it at this point. They've just thrown everything off. Remember, the prostakao can be used in hope or in fear, positively or negatively. Waiting in, for example, waiting in the dark of night to see if you'll crash on the rocks is prostakao. Negative, yes, but what about a child a week before Christmas? They're in prostakao too. Or knowing that you're going to receive an inheritance and you're just waiting for the lawyer to call you to tell you how much you got. That's prostakao too. We see the men on the ship go from the most wretched physical, emotional, psychological conditions for many days to praying, to listening to Paul, who was ignored, to eating the food on board. Sound familiar for you today? The resonating, I don't know where I am. I'm not sure where I'm going. I want to feel safe, secure, things to be normal again. But in this story, the Lord told the men through Paul that they could eat as much as they wanted. Because we serve a generous God who doesn't withhold from us. So when Paul stood up, Yes. Question. How much did these men's faith, how much did they have in Paul and his God? They were so persuaded. This, this is a quote from Matthew Poole's commentary of Acts 27, 38, when he addresses the obedience of the men to dump the remaining grain overboard. Quote, cast out the wheat, the provision they had for their sustenance, this is the third time they had lightened the ship, being willing that all their goods should perish for them rather than with them. And isn't that opposite of what we see with the world today? Everyone's trying to grab as many toys as they can, like they think they're gonna, they're spending all their money and trying to grab everything like they can take it with them. These men got the right idea. I'll feed on God then. I'll have more God, please. I don't need this. I don't, dump it, dump it. I've eaten, I, I trust Paul, his God. If his, God's, if his God is protecting Paul, saving Paul, I believe Paul, then why won't he save me too? I, I'm not gonna hold on to my earthly stuff. I'm not gonna hold on to this, try to grab onto this here. I'm not gonna trust that this is gonna feed me. It didn't help me so far. It wasn't in God until God told me to. Okay, I'll obey now, I'll do that. These heathens were so far persuaded by St. Paul, they ventured their lives upon the credit of what he had foretold them. They parted with their food, all they had to live upon, only upon his word that they should want them in the ship no more. And when I look at this prophetically, I see these men ravenous after more than just the mere food for their bellies. They, ho they hunger for hope, for faith, for something greater. Paul broke the bread, blessed the bread, then began to eat. Only then were the men encouraged enough and ate as well. They didn't know of the Last Supper, and there are some scholars that say this wasn't a Last Supper moment. I don't know. But when people are lost and hurting and confused, cold, tired, overwhelmed, wandering, it's really the words that we speak that reaches them. It's the power of the love that we display. Truly, only the power of God could touch them so deeply that they would dump their remaining food in the sea. I have a hard enough time like skipping lunch, so I just, I, it's a, that's a, it's a big one. Practically speaking, doing so would lighten the ship, enabling it to rise higher with less ability to crash on the rocks. But there was a greater lightening of the load, I think, it was the newfound faith and hope these men had. 
and the trust in Paul and his God. And it didn't just happen in that moment. It happened, it began happening all the moments before. All the men knew who Paul was and they'd been watching him from the moment he came aboard ship. The final verse is, it's okay, we're just gonna go. Just go ahead and start the music, I'll do it. Oh, that's right, Never mind. thank you. Well, don't you do, okay, that's right, thank you. The final verses of this chapter, verses 39 through 44, we're not gonna read them, but it does explain how the ship did go aground. The soldiers had planned to kill the prisoners, because remember, if a prisoner got away, the soldiers died. So it was better for them if they killed the soldier, uh, killed the, I'm sorry, if the soldiers let the prisoners get away, the soldier would die, would be killed for that. That was a death, that was it. So it was better for them to kill them than let them escape. Julius the centurion in charge of Paul protected him and that single choice to save the man of God saved the rest of the men when they all reached land safely. So in conclusion, this last slide shows the word adrift, adrift without motive, power, without anchor, without ties, guidance or security. When I read the word of God, I ask Holy Spirit to help me enter into the scene, to understand and grasp how I would feel if the same thing happened to me. And isn't that what we kind of do when we enter into novels and stories? The truth of the living word of God is that it is the living word of God. That's why we can read the same scripture, you know, years, days, hours apart, and it's like, oh, wow, I didn't even see that before. The bottom line is, and I know you've all heard this, I don't read the word. I let the word read me. And if you hear nothing else but this this morning, and I'll feel really good if this is what you get from me, you are not adrift at sea. Even in our most challenging times, our most sinful choices, our most carnal decisions, we are not alone. The one who guides us is still sovereign. He's still in charge, and he's still Lord over all. The men on the ship, the soldiers, the sailors, the prisoners, they were focused on the size and severity of the storm, like we saw in the initial um, clips. They had every reason to respond the ways that they did. Paul had to deal with all the same effects of the storm that they did and he chose to direct his attentions to the Lord he knows. Remember the keel? Beneath the surface, the backbone of your boat, but the keel keeps you from drifting. And because we are in this world and will deal with stormy seas, we can either, I, oh, that's it, or we can give up. This is the song, and I'm hoping that it plays, that really encapsulates this morning. Can we turn out the lights? I don't know if we can or not. Sure by now God you would have reached down And wiped our tears away Stepped in and saved the day But once again I say amen And it's still raining But as the thunder rolls I barely hear You whisper through the rain I'm Mercy falls. I'll raise my hands and praise the God who gives and takes away.
my strength is almost gone How can I carry on If I can't find you But as the thunder rolls I barely hear you whisper through the rain I'm with you And as your mercy falls I'll raise my hands And praise the God who gives And takes away not for I have redeemed you I have summoned you by name you are mine when you pass through the waters I will be with you and when you pass through the rivers they will not sweep over you when you walk through the fire you will not be burned the flames will not set you ablaze Isaiah 43 verses 1 and 2 give up Hebrews 6 19 we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Give up so that we may all say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course and I have kept the faith. God bless you. Amen. I should have had tissue. Oh, that's our end. Okay. Lord, thank you for this morning and thank you. I and I just trust your words today have reached the hearts and the deep soil of those who love you and have come seeking after you, God. You know what we need. You know how we need to hear it, how we receive from you, Lord. And thank you. And Father, give us opportunity now to respond. That it doesn't just end when we walk out the door and get in our cars, God. There are people that need to hear you through us. Lord, and we don't know who that is today, this week. We don't know who that is, God, but help us to position ourselves for not just our stormy seas, but to be invited into the oceans of suffering that is all around us today, Lord. We thank you, God. Thank you so much for being the faithful one. Thank you for this morning. By the blood of Jesus, we pray. 
Amen.